Coming up to the stage next, Jeffrey Tucker. Thanks. Thank you for staying up all night. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> but it's a marvelous thing to be able to speak at this historic occasion. I don't know that I don't. I never thought I would see in my lifetime. I must say, but that's the nature of the structure and trajectory of history that it never stops surprising us with unexpected things. For so many years, so long, I can recall people sort of looking down on the Libertarian Party, saying, what are they doing? This is absurd. We live in a two-party system. These people, these chirping sectaries, there's no hope for them. Why do they keep doing this? Why do they keep gathering year after year to lose elections? <laughs> and yet, here we are, the work of 40 years, more than 40 years, finally paying off because the libertarians are here right when the country actually, right when civilization needs us most. It's true, it's true. To whom do we owe a debt of gratitude? We owe a debt of gratitude to all of those who have come before. Those visionaries in the early 1970s who first put together the Libertarian Party despite every warning, don't do this, this is absurd. Richard Nixon is your liberty candidate. <laughs> He's the man who will protect liberty for you. You don't need a libertarian party. My friend Murray Rothbard was um, initially skeptical about, uh, about, I mean, I like that clapping for Murray. <laughs> Murray, right? You know, I still, I still have one of Murray's bow ties. He gave it to me, and um, and uh, I don't wear it. Why? It's a, sort of like a religious thing or something. I'm afraid to put it on. You know, what what would happen to me? I don't know. <laughs> I shrink and speak with a Brooklyn accent or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, but Murray came around. Murray came around on the Libertarian Party because he said, "Damn it, people care about politics." And this is one way we can get the word out. And I don't know, I don't, I don't know what the results of this will be. People say that we'll lose elections and that will discredit the liberty message. But you know, um, we have to have some way to get the message out there. So we saw it primarily as an educational vehicle, but not only that. You know, Murray was a man of faith. Actually, you are too, now <laughs> that I think about it. We all are, because we believe in the hope of something we can't see. And that is the cause of human liberty. It's not always visible to us, especially in the political uh, system. So I'd like to use, oh, let me just back up slightly. You've enjoyed the convention, I have too. But probably like you, I've been startled by the extent of the divisions and the intensity of passion shown at this event towards various ideas and um, the arguments, which have been very intense. Every cocktail I've tried to enjoy has been interrupted with somebody telling me such and such candidate is very evil. Uh, <laughs> and my, uh, my preferred candidate is very good. Um, and the more I listen to this, I may realize I, you know, if I was going to judge the candidates by my own political values, uh, they would all fail miserably. And <laughs> as a matter of fact, I've yet to quiz any of them on my two pet issues. Uh, the first one, of course, is the abolition of copyright and patent laws. Great evil in the world, right? And, and, and the, the second issue is, is the, the end of the underage drinking laws. Yeah. Uh, 
corrupted generation of youth, actually. These horrid laws, so destructive. So I've not heard a word about either of those, those issues. So I should, shouldn't support anybody. But look, yeah, there are divisions among us. Strategic, methodological, philosophical, political priorities, class, region, personal history, lots of things. Why is that? Why is that true? And I think the reason is that liberty is itself a very diverse idea. Within the structure of human liberty, we find the whole of, of, of human diversity lives within it. And the irony is that none of us in this room, none of us at this convention, know the right way forward and that is precisely why we need human liberty. Because we don't know. Because we need to discover. And whatever you want to say about everyone who's running for any office under the Libertarian Party at any level in this country, and especially at the highest levels, they are all united in one central principle, that we need freedom in order to discover. That the state is too large, that it has restricted us, and it is a reactionary force, and that history cannot continue to move forward without broadening the scope of human liberty. And on that, we can all agree. And you know what? I'm not just up here pleading for unity. I don't believe in that. What I do think is that from a historical point of view, this party represents something extremely significant. And this is what I would like to devote the, the, um, my remarks to today to help you understand the context and the framework of what we're doing here and why it matters. Let's go back to the 19th century in the UK and the US and understand a little bit about the way politics has broken down in the developed world under democracy. There have generally been three forces of political activity alive. The first one could be broadly classified as labor, the second one broadly classified as Tory, and the third one broadly classified as liberal. The third one is who we are. We are the liberals. What do the liberals believe in? The liberals believe in a world without dictators, the capacity of society to manage itself without central authority, and with that comes a commitment to free speech, civil liberties, peace, local rights, the capacity of freedom to, of uh, people to manage their own lives, the transformative power of commercial activity and exchange, the division of labor, free migration, freedom of religion, these are all liberal principles. These are all things on which we can agree. Now what about the other two great forces? The first one being labor. Traditionally, labor rose up in opposition to the age of laissez-faire and the extraordinary changes that are brought on the world in the 19th century. It's been a coalition of social democrats, labor unions looking to cartelize their uh, party, to, uh, to cartelize the labor markets. Um, it's typically represented the public sector bureaucracy. That's included the socialists and the communists and the Marxists and everything in between. That is labor. It's traditionally favored wealth redistribution. It's opposed laissez-faire on grounds that have considered laissez-faire to be uh, at war with uh, the idea of human equality, perhaps, um, uh, that it um, uh, was uh, not making the right kinds of advances for the right sort of people. But the, the, the Labour Party rose up in opposition to laissez-faire. And on the other side, which today we would call the left, these terms have shifted around in European history. Today we just generally call them the left. And we understand what's wrong with them because they survive to this day, right? They're represented by the Bernie Sanders and the Hillary Clintons and so on. Um, on the right, we have the Tories. In their purest form, represented the, the landed aristocracy, the ruling classes, 
the large corporations, the big banks, the families with deep roots in history that have always controlled the systems of communication and uh, the, the bond dealers and so on. These are the Tory classes, the aristocracy. We have our own. Now, where does liberalism fit into this? Typically, in the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, especially the 19th century, um, liberalism and Toryism have generally been united. The Tories have invited the liberal parties within it to subsist within its structures. That was true in the 19th century. This coalition began to break down in the interwar period, and a very strange thing happened. The world broke down between two, two choices. On one hand, socialism, and on the other hand, fascism. Socialism representing the labor rights, and the fascists representing the ruling classes purged of its liberal impulses. This is what happens to the right wing. When it kicks out the liberals, it starts believing and doing very strange and ghastly things. Without us, the Tory party is mostly hopeless. And we have, we have gone along with this pretty well in the early part of the 20th century. We, we existed for a while, but you know, in the interwar period, they kicked us out. Um, the New Deal and following represented a kind of diaspora for liberalism. It happened all over the world. It happened all over the UK, all over Europe, and it happened in the US. And we had no home, we had no party. And we went into exile. And there we remained for a very long time until after World War II. The real revival of liberalism in the 20th century, I think, began in 1946 with the foundation, with the establishment of the Foundation for Economic Education in the US. Liberalism went from being a political party, a political interest, sometimes separate from the Tories, sometimes united with them, to living in exile, to becoming a philosophical movement and that embedded itself within the context of a think tank, for example, a social movement, churches, civic groups, reading clubs, magazines. It was small, but it kept the flame of liberalism alive. And that's where things stood between 1946 and about 1980, when a remarkable thing happened both in the US and in the UK, and to some extent, all over Latin America and Europe. And that was, once again, the coming together of the Tory party and the old Liberal Party through the work of Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher. What they attempted to do was unite the old cause of liberalism for human freedom, free trade, free migration, free speech, civil liberties, low taxes, love of commerce, and its transforming effect on society with the old Tories. And that was a powerful union. In many ways, it transformed the world. And we saw a revival of prosperity and the prospects for peace in the world. And it was a beautiful thing to see. Not that I believe in everything Reagan and Thatcher did. They were far too warmongering for me, uh, far too tolerant of government through budget deficits and spending. Uh, uh, they're, they're not my types. <laughs> but the problem with Reagan and Thatcher was not their liberalism, it was their Toryism, you know? I mean, they were good because we hung around them, because they were interested in who we are and what we're doing. That's what made the miracles of the economic recovery of the 80s, and even to some extent the 90s possible. And I think to some extent it was this union that began the breakdown of the modern nation state, which I think fundamentally has broken down and will continue to. And there's no hope for it's being revived at all in our lifetime. And for that, I'm very, very grateful. Freedom is loose on the world mainly because of this. Mainly because of this. If you think back, most of the great things that have happened in our world today are due to the reforms that took place in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Not much progress has been made in politics ever since those days. The union of liberalism and Toryism was awesome. 
and we know about this because it happened in our lifetime. We're aware of it as libertarians. But my friends, something amazing happened in 2015. Something transformative happened. And I feel, in many ways, like I was there for it. I heard one of the very speeches, first speeches in the political campaign of Donald Trump. <laughs> and it was amazing. Now the audience that I was there with, I can tell most people could not understand what political ideology he represented because he began first with a vitriolic attack on basically every other country in the world besides the United States. <laughs> Everyone is a threat. Everyone is ripping us off. And he just ticked through a list, you know, dozens of countries, Mexico and India, and I don't know, the Philippines and Vanuatu, and, and you know, just everybody's a threat. Everybody's stealing from us. And he imagined in his mind an autarkic society, yeah. massive trade protections, exclusion, nationalism, nativism. And my mouth began to drop because I had read a book by Ludwig von Mises published in 1944 called Omnipotent Government. I encourage you to have a look at it, actually. It's the template for the Trump campaign. The ideology in question was fascism, and I wondered how far this man would carry it, and he carried it very far. Indeed, his very next theme was on the subject of migration. It's not just that other countries are ripping us off in terms of trade, they're invading our borders. This country that was built by immigration, that it subsisted for 150 years, well, nearly 200 years, without any restrictions on migrations whatsoever. The first real restrictions on migration to this country came in the 1920s, mostly influenced by the ideology of eugenics. Yeah. Um, he stood up and said that they are our enemies, and our enemies are in our midst. And a man with a, with a slight Spanish accent stood up to a microphone and began to question this railing against immigration from Mexico. And Trump interrupted him and demanded to know whether or not he had been sent by the Mexican government to subvert his campaign. It was an amazing moment. I thought, how far can this demagoguery go? And it pushed further and further and further. The racial dog whistles, the demonization, of uh, non-majority populations, and as we've seen uh, over time, over the last year, the praising of internment camps, the calling for the censorship of the press, the longing for the shutdown of the internet, and so on and so on. I mean, what we have emerging here is a very old-fashioned ideology. It's called fascism. And it might be best understood as sort of the reductionism of Tories, of Toryism, absent the influence of liberalism. The point is, I saw it early on. This was, I think, last July, and Newsweek ran my article, does Donald Trump represent the revival of fascism in America? My answer was yes. Newsweek ran it. And at that point, I knew for sure that I had a very strong interest in making sure this president guy doesn't become president because, my friends, I will definitely be deported. I can promise you that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is a slight problem for me. Uh, and just yesterday, the New York Times ran an article. I encourage you to look at it. It's called, uh, Is Fascism on the Rise Globally? And it chronicled not only the rise of Trump in the U.S., but the rise of far-right parties in, in Europe, uh, in Hungary, in Austria, in Germany, in Spain, Denmark, Sweden, all over, the, all over the world. And it's right, and it's true. My friends, this is happening to us. 
This is what happens in the late stage of the state. The political parties become ever more wicked and vicious. And I hope we understand what's happened here. Unlike the 1980s, where the Tories invited us in to improve them, to civilize them, give them a cause, give them something to believe in, inspire them with certain ideals. What happened in 2015 is that we were completely purged from the Republican Party. And anyone who does not understand that just is not thinking with his or her eyes open and his mind open. Look around, observe, understand. These are not our friends. These people hate us, and they hate the cause of human liberty. And if they get control, it will be just like it was in the interwar period. We will be the first to go. Please understand. Please understand this. Not everyone does. We have a lot to learn. Where should we turn to understand? I would recommend two books. The first one being that great book by Ludwig von Mises, 1944, Omnipotent Government. It represented a kind of a culmination of his academic career. In there, he laid out something that he had not seen before, and he had changed his mind on a number of subjects. In the early 1920s, he warned the world about the danger of the rise of the Reds, about the labor rights and socialism and what it would do to the world. And he wrote a marvelous book called Socialism in 1922 that rocked all of Europe and shook a lot of socialists and turned them over to the cause of liberalism. In 1929, he wrote a beautiful book called Liberalism Itself, which I still consider my, my, my Bible of politics. It's a marvelous book where he's explained the ideology of liberalism as dedicated to peace, dedicated to commerce, tolerance, civil liberties, beautiful book. But an extraordinary thing happened in the early 1930s. He looked out his office window in Vienna at the Chamber of Commerce and saw marching up and down the streets of Vienna, not red shirts, but brown shirts, people who claimed to be saving Vienna from the communists, but who themselves represented a very wicked totalitarian ideology. An ideology that hates capitalism, hates the idea of human liberty and civil liberties, and tried to rally an entire country around the idea of racial solidarity. The idea was fascism, and he realized that there could be grave danger, grave dangers to the world outside of the left, that the right itself can represent a form of totalitarianism. And my friends, he fled very wisely. He went to Geneva in 1934, probably saved his life. Yeah. Otherwise, he might have ended up in a cattle car, in a ghetto, and possibly in a gas chamber. Instead, he lived in exile for six years and wrote the great book, Human Action, which came out in German in 1940, and guess what? No one cared, right? No one cared. Penniless, 60 years old, without a job, he boarded a ship and came to the United States. And on that boat, on that boat he wrote a book that was only published long after his death. And he said, I started out to be a reformer, but I ended up only as a historian of decline. This man is despairing. But once he arrived in the US, he decided he would fight all over again. And his great book was Omnipotent Government. The biggest, most vitriolic, most comprehensive attack on the Nazi party of Germany ever written. Have a look at it, it's absolutely brilliant. And you will recognize, you will recognize the themes that we see all around us in the world today. By the way, five years later, 
he was persuaded to do an English translation of that 1940 book, and the result was Human Action, and uh, it became a bestseller, <laughs> and it's still the awesome book. It never would have been published had Leonard Reed at the Foundation for Education not agreed to buy the entire first print run. So you see what happens. The liberals go into exile, they establish think tanks, they establish their own parties, they establish their civic clubs, their church groups, their publishing houses, their newsletters, and then we save the frickin' world. That's how it works. That's how it works. Because we exist and, and argue in the realm of ideas. We believe in ideas. We understand they're more powerful than states. 1944 was also the year of the publication of a great work by F.A. Hayek called The Road to Serfdom. Probably you own it. You probably own it. Probably you put a picture of it on Instagram. Uh, you might have taken a selfie with the cover. I would urge you to do something even more, which is to read it. <laughs> It is dedicated to the socialists of all parties. What did he mean by that? He meant the parties of the left and of the right. And he says in that book, we have been worried for the better part of a century about the rise of socialists of the left. But look around, my friends, what threatens liberty the most in our time? It is the socialists of the right. It is the brown shirts. The totalitarians, it is the Tories without the liberals, because we were purged, that represent the threat among us. Wake up, stop looking for communists under the bed, and notice the fascists, the Nazis, the ruling class all around you. They are your enemies, and they hate us. This is the upshot of this book. It's amazing. Two books, same year. We still haven't learned the lesson, and I know why. It's because none of us have lived through it. We were there in the 1980s, where the Republicans were friendly to us. We were there, we watched what happened in the UK, and we thought, perhaps, fascism had been defeated in World War II, and we don't have to worry about it anymore. So, we began to sleep and we began to not care. I hope that that has changed now as a result of the extraordinary events of 2015. We are in a diaspora again. But you know what? It's not 1946 anymore. It's 2016. And things have changed. We are no longer a tiny minority with newsletters and small underfunded think tanks and small groups. We are those of us in this room. We have a mighty and impressive political party. The liberals now have a voice in politics. And don't let anyone tell you that this is a two-party system. Yeah, right? It's a two-party system. We can never win this. Bullshit. <laughs> you know why? Because history can change. They said Trump would never win the, no the Republican nomination. Oh, that clown. That'll never happen. He did it anyway. Shocking the world, all right? There's very few things about Trump that inspires me, but the fact that he defied every prediction, that is inspiring at some level. So we too as a party can break through the existing establishment and all the predictions of our demise and make a difference in the world. But you know what? It's not just about a political party. There's much more going on underneath the surface that this party represents. It is liberalism itself and its triumph. Where does it exist? It exists everywhere in the technology sector. It exists in especially in the rise of the P2P economy, which is laying waste to the old institutions that have mediated our, our connections in the past, which now we're able to connect peer-to-peer. -peer. My friends, 
Miracles are happening every day. Do you understand that in 2009, a money was invented out of digital code? A money that is a real alternative to the, to the nation state monies that, that have been nationalized for the last 100 years? No one believed it was possible. An anonymous programmer did it, and he put it out on a free forum. And that currency is Bitcoin. And I believe that that currency will change the world. Anarchy is breaking loose all over the world. Do you understand? Anarchy is loose. They can no longer control the system. Our communications are fast and global. The app economy no longer cares about the borders of the nation state. The regulators are running for their lives. They are in panic in every city in this country about what's happening to their transportation system, what's happening to their rotten, vicious, racist zoning controls. The regulations that used to govern the creation of products in this country are being destroyed as a result of the technological innovations of 3D printing. They think, they believed in 1972 that they would abolish the presence of cannabis in our country. <laughs> Richard Nixon said this. It did not happen. And why? Because we will not live in cages. We will always fight free. And the biggest government, the biggest government is no match against the individual who desires and demands that freedom that is our right, that is integral to the human personality, that can never finally be distinct, extinguished. The nation state as it was created in the 20th century, that Leviathan that purports to rule our lives, our relationships, our associations, codify our marriages, intervene between our relationships between employers and employees, dares to tell us where we can live, what kind of businesses we can start, who we can love. That nation state, that Leviathan state, is an unviable, unsustainable project. It is a failure, and it cannot live. All it needs is a push. My friends, that's what we're here to do. We are here to push this machinery of servitude into the dustbin of history. We represent the cause of liberalism. Liberalism saved humanity from serfdom. It abolished slavery. It emancipated women from a society of, contract, of conquest and granted rights of contract. It created the middle class. It brought us out of feudalism and inspired a population for the first time in the history of humanity to imagine that we could experience in our lifetimes social mobility. The idea of human progress was born with the idea of liberalism the late Middle Ages, and it matured, and it matured, and got better and stronger, until the late 19th century, 19th century looked around and said, my God, what has happened? Incomes are higher, lifetimes are larger, the human population is growing. It turns out humanity can live together in peace, provided we have the right institutions. And it was a beautiful thing to see. And they tried to shut it down. In the course of the 20th century, that's what they tried to do. But we look around the world today, and what do we see? We see that their systems have utterly failed. Everything. Their school systems, their medical systems, their systems of passports and marriage licenses their controls, their age restrictions, their zoning laws, their patents, their taxes, their welfare state, their ghastly murderous wars. 
everything has failed. You can see it and you can feel it. That paradigm of managing life from the top down through authority structures, call it what you want, call it labor, call it Tory, call it left, call it right, it is no longer working. There are too many anomalies in the system. We have tasted freedom at our times. Every time you pick up your smartphone, you taste it, you feel it, you can curate your life, you can communicate with whom you want, you can engage in trades as you want. We know what freedom feels like. We will never go back. I don't care. I don't care how much Clinton wants to take us back to the 1990s, or Trump wants to take us back to the 1950s. The clock will not run backwards. History will move forwards. And that forward motion of history is towards freedom, not just for those of us in this room, or those of us in, country, in this country, but for every human being all across this planet. Dignity will be universal. Rights will be universal. And that system of oppression will come down, my friends, it's going to happen in our lifetimes. So the Libertarian Party is about more than just winning elections. You understand this now, right? We represent liberalism, all of us, all the candidates. We represent a party and an idea, an idea that will not be extinguished, an idea that owns the future. It's not just about this party, it's about the capacity of the human imagination to outthink and outsmart those who would try to rule us and ruin us and wreck us. The beautiful thing about a, an idea is, is this. It is malleable, it is portable, it is weightless, it is eternal, it is immutable. No army in the world can crush an idea. With the internet, we saw the idea of human liberty move out of physical spaces into the digital cloud. That was the beginning of the end. It all started in 1995. You know, that was the year Murray Rothbard died. I'll always believe that God invented the web browser to give us a replacement for Murray. <laughs> we had to have it. We lost our mightiest intellectual, so we got the mightiest tool we ever could. And We've all used it very, very well. Let me conclude by saying, you, all of you, each of you, is in the right place, at the right time, in the right party, representing the right cause of human liberty. We will triumph in our lifetime.